Vectors! Flight 209er, you are cleared for takeoff. Roger. Huh? LA departure frequency 123.9er. Roger. Huh? Request vector. Over. What? Flight 209er, clear for vector 324. We have clearance, Clarence. Roger, Roger. What's our vector, Victor? Now at radio clearance, over. Then Clarence, over. Over. Roger. Huh? Roger, over. What? Huh? Who? In section 9.4, we look at vectors. And so what is a vector? A vector is a quantity. with both magnitude and direction. And we represent this represented by directed line segments. So one of the best examples we have in real life of a vector is the wind. When you go outside and you feel the wind, you can feel how strong the wind is, which is the magnitude, and you can also feel which direction the wind is blowing. So the wind is uh, can be represented by a vector. So in pre-calculus, we do some things like this. So we have point P, which will be the initial point of our vector, sometimes called the tail. And then this goes to some other point, Q. And it's a directed line segment, so you put the arrow at the end on the terminal side, where it ends, or the terminal point here. And of course, that would be called the head. And then we can write this as the vector PQ. Now, the ordering of the letters is important. The first letter is the tail, the second letter is the head, and it indicates the direction in which the vector is moving. Uh, there's a couple of other things that we want to talk about. There is a zero vector, which has no magnitude. So it's a vector with no magnitude or zero magnitude. You might think of it that way. And there's no direction needed. And the symbol for the zero vector is just to draw a zero with the arrow over it. If that's in handwriting, if you'll look down here at this note here, whenever vectors are typed, they're traditionally typed with bold face letters. And so the zero vector could be typed as a big bold face zero. But if you're doing handwriting, then you just write the little arrow over the the top of the symbol. Let's write down some of the examples of vectors. And we already talked about one, the wind. Um, another one would be other forces, like uh, the speed of an airplane. That would be velocity, uh, tension in wires holding stuff up would be an example of a vector as well. All right, so let's take a look at a geometric view of vectors and how vectors work. So suppose I have these two vectors, v and w, and you can sort of look and see how v is characterized on this grid. v is the vector that starts at a point and then goes sort of up one unit, I'll sort of draw this here for you, up one unit, and then over one, two, three, four units. So it, it goes up one unit and then to the right four units. W is the vector that goes up one, two, three units, and then over one unit to the right. Let's go ahead and do the sum of V plus W. To do that, I'm going to start with a point, doesn't matter where. And then I'm going to produce the v vector, so that's going to go up 1 and over 4. 
going to end at that point. So there's the V vector. Then from this new point, we go ahead and tack on the W vector that goes up three units and then over one to that point there. The sum V plus W is the vector that results from starting at the initial tail and ending at the final head. So this new red vector here is V plus W. And sometimes you'll hear that referred to as the resultant vector. Because it's the result of two vectors. Let's look at V minus W. So again, you can start anywhere. V goes up one and then over four. That's our V vector. And then the W vector is the one that should go up three and to the right one. But because of the negative, the negative of the vector is the one that has the same magnitude but the opposite direction. So negative W should be the one that starts at a point and then goes down three while going back one. So we'll take that vector and put it here. So down three, one, two, three, and then over one. The resultant is the same. It goes from the original tail to the final head. So this is V minus W. Next, we have V minus V. So essentially, you have a force that's going to go up one and over four. And then from that position, you're going to take another force that is going to do the exact opposite. So the result here is just nothing. It starts and ends at the same spot. So, and this isn't, shouldn't be a surprise, V minus V is the zero vector. It's sort of like you have one force pushing in one direction at a certain magnitude, and then you have another force pushing with the exact same magnitude in the exact opposite direction. Uh, nothing moves. So that's a zero vector. Our next example is 3w. So essentially what 3w represents is w plus w plus w. This is going to be referred to as scalar multiplication. And scalar multiplication just multiplies the magnitude of the vector by the scalar but it leaves the direction the same as long as that scalar is positive. So if I just start right here, my w vector goes one, two, three up and one over. So I'll do that, but I'll do it three times. So one, two, three over one, one, two, three over one, one, two, three over one. And so we have one, two, three w. Let's look at our next example. We have three different vectors now, a u, a v, and a w, and we want to find 2v plus w plus 5u. So I'm going to go ahead and start right here. And the first thing we want to do is 2v. So v goes up 1, 2, and then over 1, 2, 3, 4. So 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4. That's 1v. And then 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, that's another V. Then we have plus 1 W. W goes 1, 2, 3 up and 1, 2, 3 back to the left. So 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. So there's the end of W. And then we have the U vector. And the U vector only goes over to the right one unit each time. And we have five of those. So it'll be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So after you put all this together, the vector that is the sum right here starts at this tail and ends at this head.
Let's take a look at the next example. And it is w plus 5u plus 2v. So I'll start at the same place I did on this last one. Right here. And the first thing we want to do is w. So that's up 3 and then back 3. Then we're going to do 5u. So that's 5 units to the right. 3, 4, 5. And then from there, we're going to do two Vs. So V was up to over 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. And then up to over 4. 3, 4. And now if I draw the resultant vector, it starts here and goes there. And if you compare the red vectors in both of these pictures that you see now, you'll see that they're the exact same vector. It doesn't matter how they got there. All that matters is that they have the same magnitude, length, and the same direction, and they do. And what this shows us is that vector addition is commutative. And commutative means that you can add them in any order and still get the same result. So these two vectors are equal. Let's talk a little bit more about magnitude. The symbol for magnitude looks sort of like absolute value, but instead of one bar, it's two bars on either side of the vector. Magnitude is represented by the length of the directed line when we draw vectors. But it represents the strength of the force, for example. If you're doing a velocity type problem with airplanes or boats, then it represents the velocity, the speed of the boat. And so uh, rel magnitude is all relative. The longer the line drawn for the vector, the larger the magnitude. Magnitude has these four properties. Number one, magnitude is always positive or zero. Number two, and it's only zero if you're dealing with the zero vector. So if the magnitude is positive, then you have some movement there. You do not have the zero vector. The magnitude of a vector and the magnitude of the opposite directed vector, those are equal. And then suppose you have some number uh, scaling the vector, that number being alpha. Then the magnitude of a scaled vector is the same as the magnitude of the vector multiplied by the absolute value of that scalar. So for example, suppose you have vector v and we scale it by multiplying it by negative 3. The negative just indicates you're going to go in the opposite direction. So the magnitude of the vector negative 3v is going to be the absolute value of negative 3 times the magnitude of v, and that's just going to be 3 times the magnitude of v, which is exactly what we would expect. So the magnitude doesn't have a direction. The direction is the other part of the vector uh, that it needs to specify the exact vector. But the magnitude is just a number. Let's talk about position vectors. For a vector v, and one way that you can write vectors is using these angle brackets, a comma v. So it looks sort of like an ordered pair. It's going to act sort of like an ordered pair. But to signify that it's a vector and not an ordered pair, they use these strange uh, angled brackets. So vector v, a comma b, a and b are called the components of the vector v. And a position vector is a vector where the initial point is the origin. 
and the terminal point is at a point P that is A comma B, uh, given that it was in this form to start with. So here we have vector V from the origin to point P A comma B, so that would be a position vector A comma B, but then suppose you have a vector somewhere else out in the XY grid, then what is this vector going to be? So the way you find this vector is you just subtract the X components, the head component minus the tail component, so X2 minus X1, comma, then subtract the Y components, Y2 minus Y1. Put them in the angle brackets, and uh, that's the vector. Uh, just always remember it's the head minus the tail. Example 1. Find the position vector V represented by the directed line segment P1 to P2. If P1 is equal to the point 2 comma 6 and P2 is the point negative 1 comma 10, then find the magnitude of V. Let's start by finding the vector V. And we do this by taking the coordinates from P2 and subtracting the coordinates of P1. So the X coordinates here would be negative 1 minus 2 and the Y coordinate would be 10 minus 6. And then we just simplify that. So that would be negative 3 comma 4. And then the question is how do we find the magnitude? Well, in general, to find the magnitude, suppose we had a vector, position vector from the origin that was a comma b. What that means is that in order to get to the vector point uh, that is represented by a b, we have to go over a units to the right or to the left, and then b units up or down. And then the magnitude is the hypotenuse. So the magnitude is found by using the Pythagorean theorem. And so it's the square root of a squared plus b squared. So you just take the x component, square it, take the y component, square it, add them up, and take the square root. So the magnitude of this vector in particular is negative 3 squared plus 4 squared, take the square root of that, and of course that's our old 3, 4, 5 triangle. So the magnitude is 5. If you graph this, you'll see that we have 1, 2, 3 on the left, 1, 2, 3, 4 on the right, and the vector is this vector. So it went over negative 3, up 4, so that's negative 3, 4, and 5, the hypotenuse. Next, let's look at a very special type of vector called unit vectors. Remember that in math, unit means one. So what does this mean in terms of vectors? Well, unit vectors are the vectors with magnitude equal to one. And of course, you know several uh, vectors already that have magnitude 1. In fact, any point on the unit circle, say root 2 over 2 comma root 2 over 2, if I just turn that into a vector, standard a position vector, then now root 2 over 2 comma root 2 over 2, the vector, is a unit vector because the magnitude from the origin to the point on the unit circle is 1 by definition. So any of these points on the unit circle easily produce unit vectors. Now we have two very special unit vectors, and they're given special symbols. And they are the i vector, which is the unit vector 1 comma 0. It goes out one unit in the x direction, so this would be the i vector. And the j vector goes 
is 0 comma 1, it goes up one unit in the y direction. And sometimes people will call these the standard basis vectors. I don't think we get that sophisticated in this class, but that is uh, some terminology used in future classes. And the reason for that is because you can build all these vectors based on the i and the j, as we see in example number two. Use the properties of, of vectors to show that v equal to ab, just any arbitrary vector, can be written in the form of v is equal to ai plus bj. So v is equal to ab. And then the question is, how can I break up this vector? Well, I could break it up into a horizontal component, which is how far I move left and right. That would be an x component of a. But if I just want the horizontal component, then I don't want to move up or down any for this particular part. So it's just going to be 0 for the y component of that. And then similarly, I can write this in terms of its vertical component. The vertical component goes nowhere left and right, but it goes up or down b units. So let me illustrate that with a little picture here. So here is an arbitrary vector ab, and then we're going to go over a, so that is the vector a comma 0, and then we're going to go up from that point b, so that would be the vector 0 comma b. And together they make the vector a, b. Well now what do we have? Well a can be thought of as a scalar, and what times a is equal to a? That's a 1. And then b can be thought of as a scalar. What times b is equal to b? That's also a 1. So we get a times the vector 1, 0, plus b times the vector 0, 1. 1, 0 is just the i vector, and 0, 1 is just the j vector. So we get a i times b j. Let's see this example in action. Example number three. Write the vector v equal to negative 4, 6 in terms of i and j. So this would just be negative 4i plus 6j. Example 4. If v is equal to 4i plus 5j and w is equal to negative 3i plus 7j, find the following. v plus w. So v plus w would be 4i plus 5j plus negative 3i plus 7j. So the way that you add vectors is that you add the components of the vectors together and simplify. So the i components, we have 4i from the left one and negative 3i from the right one. 4 minus 3 is 1, so we just get 1i. And then we can add the j components. 5j plus 7j is 12j. Example B, what is 2V? So this would be 2 times 4i plus 5j. So to scale up a vector, you just scale up the components of the vector. So in other words, you just distribute. So we'll get 8i plus 10j. Example C. 5v minus 2w. So we'll have 5 times the v vector, 4i plus 5j, minus 2 times the vector negative 3i plus 7j, distribute the 5 and the negative 2 to get 20i plus 25j plus 6i minus 14j, and then combine the i's and the j's. So 20i plus 6i is 26i, 
25j minus 14j is 11j. Part D. Find the magnitude of w plus 2v. So in order to find the magnitude of this vector, let's go ahead and compute what the vector is first, and then we'll take the magnitude. So the w vector was negative 3i plus 7j plus 2 times the v vector. That's 4i plus 5j. Simplify, and you get negative 3i plus 7j plus 8i plus 10j. Combine the i's and the j's together, and we get 5i plus 17j. Next, let's find the magnitude. So the magnitude of w plus 2v is going to equal the square root of 5 squared plus 17 squared, which is the square root of 314. Example 5. Create a unit vector in the same direction as v equals 5i plus 12j. So let's take a look at the picture. So we have a vector that has 5i and 12j as a component. It looks like this. What we want is a vector that has the same direction as this vector, but only has a magnitude of 1. So what we can do is first compute the magnitude of this vector. The magnitude would be the square root of 5 squared plus 12 squared, which is the square root of 25 plus 144, which is the square root of 169, which is equal to 13. So right now, this vector has magnitude of 13. What we want to do is to scale this down so that its magnitude is only 1. So what scale factor should I use times this vector v so that it only has magnitude 1? You should multiply this vector v times 1 over the magnitude. So let's find... 1 over the magnitude of v times the vector v. So this would be 1 over 13 times 5i plus 12j. Well, the 1 13th distributes, and you get 5 over 13i plus 12 over 13j. And this is the unit vector. We can check that this is a unit vector by just finding the magnitude. Now, I'll tell you that a lot of times people write this new vector as u. u stands for unit. So let's go ahead and find the magnitude of u. And that would be the square root of 5 over 13 squared plus 12 over 13 squared. When you square fractions, you square both the top and the bottom. So this would be 25 over 169 plus the square of 12 is 144. The square of 13 is 169. These fractions have a common denominator. So we'll add, we get 25 plus 144 over 169. But 25 plus 144 is 169. Divided by 169 is the square root of 1. 
and the square root of 1 is equal to 1. Since the magnitude is equal to 1, we do have a unit vector. Next, let's talk about direction angles. So given the magnitude of v and the direction angle alpha of the vector between the vector itself and i. Now the, we use i here because this is sort of a standard position vector. If this is the vector v and this is the vector i, then the angle that we want is in standard position and we call that alpha. So if you have these two things, then one way that you can build the vector is by specifying its magnitude multiplied by the x component cosine of alpha times i and the y component, the sine of alpha times j. Now why does this work? Well, let's just draw a little picture and we'll make it a simple picture here. And let's suppose that this is a vector v, so the length of the vector is its magnitude. And let's suppose that it makes an angle of alpha with the positive x-axis, or more particular, more specific, the angle i, uh, the vector i. In this case, then we can relate this vector in terms of its horizontal component a and its vertical component, b. In doing so, we can create the cosine function. So the cosine of alpha is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse. The adjacent is a, but the hypotenuse is the magnitude. So the horizontal component, a, can be solved for, and you get the magnitude of v times the cosine of the angle alpha. Similarly, in this triangle, we can find the sine of alpha. The sine of alpha is the opposite, b, over the hypotenuse, the magnitude of v. Solve this for b, and you get b is equal to the magnitude of v times the sine of alpha. So vector v is actually magnitude of v times the cosine of alpha times i plus the magnitude of v times the sine of alpha times j. And then you just factor out the magnitude. And so that gives us magnitude times cosine of alpha i plus sine of alpha times j. Again, what we're seeing here is the strong relationship throughout this course that anything that has to do with the x has to do with cosine, and anything that has to do with y has to do with sine. Example 6. Find the vector that has magnitude 4 and a direction angle of 120 degrees. So we'll say v is equal to, based on my formula, it's the magnitude times the cosine of the angle times i, vector i, plus the sine of the angle, 120 degrees, times vector j. And then we just work this out. So it would be 4 times the cosine of 120 degrees is negative 1 half, plus the sine of 120 degrees is root 3 over 2 times j. And then we distribute. So we get negative 2i plus 2 root 3j. Example 7. A wagon is being pulled with a force of 12 newtons. The handle makes an angle of 30 degrees with the horizontal. Express the force pulling the wagon as a vector. What is the horizontal component of the pulling force, and what is the vertical component of the pulling force? 
So first, draw the wagon. Here is the horizontal, and the handle on the wagon makes an angle of 30 degrees. The wagon is being pulled with a force of 12 newtons. So that force is in this direction, because the uh, kid is pulling it from the handle, and the handle is at a 30 degree angle. Now the question is, what is the horizontal component and what is the vertical component? So the horizontal component will be this vector here, and the vertical component will be this vector here. So one of the easiest ways to do this is just to write this vector v in terms of the direction angle that we uh, used in the above formula. So this will be 12 times the cosine of 30 degrees, i, plus the sine of 30 degrees, j. And then work this out. Cosine of 30 degrees is root 3 over 2. So root 3 over 2 times i. And then sine of 30 degrees is 1 half. That becomes 1 half j. Distribute the 12, and we get 6 root 3 i plus 6 j. So the horizontal component is the coefficient of the i, so that would be 6 root 3 newtons. And the vertical component would be the coefficient of the j, 6 newtons. And that makes perfect sense. The 6 root 3 is a larger quantity and because the wagon is being pulled more horizontally than it's being pulled vertically. Example number 8. Connect with physics. We have a force of 300 pounds is required to push a piano up a ramp inclined at 20 degrees from the horizontal. How much does the piano weigh? So let me draw a little picture of the situation. There's the horizontal. Here's 20 degrees up a ramp. Here's the piano. It's a little upright piano. Something like that, yes. Okay. And then we need to identify some forces. So force number one, F1, is going to be the force of gravity. The force of gravity is commonly known as weight. And that force, everything is going to act from this point right here, that force goes straight down perpendicular to the ground. Force number two, F2, is going to be the force pushing the piano up the ramp. Now, most probably that force is is somewhere over here, pushing like this. But since it's a vector, we can put it anywhere we want. So one strategic place to put this is at the head of F1. But that force has the same magnitude and is parallel to the force. You just moved it around a little bit. Our final force is the force of the piano
pushing against the ramp. So that would be this force here. And this is called F3. And these are our three forces at work. Now, by symmetry, this is a right, or not symmetry, a similarity. This is a right angle, and so is this. And this is a 20 degree angle, because it's congruent to that angle. Now I'm going to draw the free body diagram. That's basically a triangle. So we have F1, F2, F3, 20 degrees. We know what F2 is because that's the amount of force pushing on the piano. That's 300 pounds. And what we're looking for is the weight of the piano. That would be F1. So using this right triangle, what relationship can I produce? F1 is the hypotenuse. F2 is opposite. So that tells me the sine relationship. So the sine of 20 degrees is equal to 300 divided by the force of F1. Now, technically we should use magnitude if we're going to represent F1 as a force, but in a lot of physics books you'll see that they just use F1 as italics, so either way probably works out okay. So the magnitude of F1 is equal to 300 divided by the sine of 20 degrees. If you work that out, you get 877 pounds. And that's the weight of the piano.